loved astronomy ever since I was a little boy, mostly because I grew up watching Star Trek and other science fiction series. I was fascinated by outer space. My parents gave me my first telescope when I was about 14 years old, and it's been a hobby ever since then. I've seen planets, galaxies, nebulas, uh, the moon, the sun, you name it. I've done my best to observe it on different instruments. I've used everything from a good pair of binoculars to a small scope to a larger scope, and hopefully now I'm moving into even larger scopes. But until now, everything that I've done has been in the visual spectrum. It's been what we call optical astronomy. Recently, however, I decided to start exploring radio astronomy. Now, anyone can understand why you'd want to do optical astronomy. You get to see all the pretty things in space, the planets, the nebulas, the galaxies, the star clusters. But why radio astronomy? Who wants to be listening for a bunch of radio signals that are coming from outer space? I mean, what am I trying to do? Find alien life? That's not what I'm doing at all. What I'm doing is looking for the exact same thing that I'm looking for in the visual light spectrum because light and radio waves are actually the same thing. Let me explain what I mean by that. Light exists as photons, packets of energy in the electromagnetic field. They have no mass and of course they travel at the speed of light. Photons are constantly being emitted and absorbed by atoms and subatomic particles. This happens for a number of reasons. An atom may emit a photon when one of its electrons jumps to a lower shell. A charged particle accelerating in an electromagnetic field will emit photons. Atoms that are hot also emit photons. Subatomic particles may emit photons as part of their decay process. And an electron in an atom will emit a photon when it flips its quantum spin to a lower energy state. Many other interactions between subatomic particles can also result in photons being emitted. Because of this, photons are everywhere. Photons exist as both waves and particles, so each has its own frequency and wavelength. When the frequency of a photon is between 400 and 790 terahertz, we see that photon as visible light. That's because the cones in our eyes are sensitive to those frequencies. The color we see is dependent on the frequency of the photon. Low frequencies are toward the red end of the spectrum, while high frequencies are toward the blue end. But we also know that photons can have frequencies higher and lower than the visible spectrum. Those with higher frequencies may fall into the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. Even though we can't see ultraviolet light, most of us are aware of it because it can damage our skin. When photons have frequencies lower than visible light, they can fall into the infrared range. This light is not visible to the human eye, but the photons are still there, allowing you, for example, to change the channel on your TV with your remote control. The spectrum also continues beyond those frequencies. As frequencies increase, we move from ultraviolet to X-rays to gamma rays. And as the frequencies drop, we move into the microwave spectrum, and then finally to the radio spectrum. Photons in the radio spectrum have low energy, low frequencies, and long wavelengths. The photons in the radio spectrum are the subject of radio astronomy. Located between the frequencies of 300 gigahertz on the high end and 30 megahertz on the low end, their wavelengths range from one millimeter to 10 meters. Recording these photons reveals information about the universe, just as seeing the photons in the visible spectrum does. By moving beyond the visible spectrum, we are able to learn much more about the universe. For example, radio waves can reveal parts of the galaxy that are hidden by regions full of gas. Light waves, with their short wavelengths, get scattered and absorbed by the gas. Radio waves, however, pass through the gas because of their long wavelengths. For my first foray into radio astronomy, I decided to build what's called the Itty Bitty Telescope, the IBT. It's a telescope design that was originally made by someone at the Society of Amateur Radio Astronomers, 
And it's a good starter scope because it's simple, it's inexpensive, but it still teaches you the basics of radio astronomy. Uh, it's made from a satellite TV dish, which you can find just about anywhere. Uh, if you don't have one at home, look around your neighborhood. You can probably find one hanging on your neighbor's house. This one I took from my parents' home. They haven't used satellite TV in about 10 years, but still had these on their house. And so I simply removed it. I built a stand on it so it can swivel. It's about $30 worth of uh, material from the local hardware store. And then I've connected a digital satellite finder that will allow me to pick up uh, when it encounters a signal. These are used generally for aiming the satellite dishes so that they're pointing at the correct satellite that is sending the radio and TV signals. But I'm gonna be using it to detect radio signals from other sources. This in turn runs to an electrical wall socket over here that powers it on about 15 volts. And this will allow me to scan the sky and it will tell me the strength of the radio waves I'm receiving. It will not, however, tell me what frequencies I am re receiving. It's going to receive a very wide band of frequencies and all it will tell me is a yes, no with a buzzer whether or not I'm receiving a signal and give me a readout on the meter of how strong that particular signal is. You'll notice I said this is called the Itty Bitty Telescope, the IBT, and that's the name that was given to it by its creator. And it may seem odd to call this an Itty Bitty Telescope. It has a dish that's about half a meter across and that's larger than any of the telescopes that I have that are optical telescopes. I have one that's about four and a half inches across and I currently have one borrowed that's about 13 inches across. So by comparison with those, this is a fairly large telescope. When you compare this telescope to other radio telescopes, it is in fact minuscule. Take for example, the largest telescope at the Green Banks National Radio Astronomy Observatory in Green Banks, West Virginia. That telescope has a dish that is 100 meters across and it has a signal gathering area of 2.3 acres. That's actually the largest steerable radio telescope, meaning one that you can turn and point at different parts of the sky. Or consider the Arecibo radio telescope, which collapsed just a few months ago after many decades of useful observation. It was 305 meters across. And we now have a new record holder for the world's largest radio telescope. It just opened a few months ago in China. It's called the 500 meter aperture spherical radio telescope, FAST, FAST. It's, as the name suggests, 500 meters across. Both the FAST telescope and the Arecibo telescope and many others are fixed telescopes, meaning that they can only observe that part of the sky that is directly above the telescope at a particular time. So you can see why they would call this the itty bitty telescope. This thing is portable, it's steerable, and only about half a meter across. So, Let's put our telescope to the test. I have this turned on, the signal finder is down here, and as we pan across the sky, I have it set fairly high, it's about 5.30 in the afternoon, so the sun is, is rather low. I have this aimed so it's going across a section of the sky where the sun isn't, and you'll see as we go across, we're not getting any signal at all. However, if we aim it at the sun, lower down on the horizon, we'll start to get a signal. And as you can hear, the signal is in a fairly narrow direction. If I turn this even slightly, the signal goes away.
and that is picking up the radio band frequencies that are produced by the sun and are being picked up by the telescope. You can see that I have the satellite finder tuned so that I'm only getting a 1% reading from an area of the sky that's away from the sun. And as I turn toward the sun, you'll notice it begin to rise and then eventually max out somewhere in the high 80s. And then as I continue past it, it'll drop once again. So when we're centered, we get about an 88 and then back to empty sky, it's down to 1%. One of the nice things about radio astronomy is that it doesn't have to be done at night. Notice we're doing this during the day, and I'm doing that because I'm observing the sun, but we can observe anything else in the universe during the day as well. And that's because radio waves penetrate our atmosphere very well. Matter of fact, it's fairly cloudy today. The sun is only barely visible through the clouds, and yet, I can still pick up a signal from the sun, even through the clouds. If you've ever done uh, much astronomy at all, you know how frustrating it is when it's cloudy, you can't do optical astronomy. When it's rainy, you can't do optical astronomy. And you're limited to doing astronomy at night. With the radio telescope, you can do it 24 hours a day, no matter what the weather is. The sun isn't the only thing, however, that produces radio waves. Matter of fact, anything that has heat is going to give off radio waves. I've got several trees here on either side of this window that I have to the sun. And if I turn this toward one of the trees, you can notice we get a very strong signal from there. Turn it past it, it goes away. I can put my hand in front and that gives me a signal as well because I produce radio waves. And if I point this at my building behind the camera, I'm going to get a strong signal as well. Interestingly, if I aim at this tree that's just to my right, you'll notice that the reading goes off the scale up to 99%. And the reason for that is that comparatively, the sun appears a lot smaller than the tree to my scope, so that I'm getting um, a much stronger reading from the tree because it takes up a larger area. So that's the first stage of the IBT. The next stage in construction will be to attach it to my computer via a software defined radio dongle that will allow the computer to process the signal and tell me which frequencies I'm listening to and which frequencies are coming in the strongest and allow me to look for particular frequencies, being able to locate things like the hydrogen line or pulsars in the sky. And I'll bring those results to you when I have them.